So we've got a few months of sort of left of 8,000 odd percent. People have been hunting ROI for as long as humans have been around. And, and when I talk about ROI, I mean more like cash flow assets. Now, historically, it's always been lending. Lending was probably one of the first cash flowing assets out there. Um, and then, as you know, uh, th those lenders turned into banks. Um, and the old fashioned way of a bank was, you know, they take money in, they give 2% out, and then they literally lend that money out at 4% and make a, a nice little arbitrage. That's basically what banks, how banks started. It hasn't been like that for thousands of years. Um, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, um, the in, in the sort of 1600s, we had the invention of the limited company. Now, the limited company is quite fascinating, if, if you ever read up on it, because what happened is the British Empire was expanding massively, and loads of ships just never returned. You know, they, they sunk, they got lost, they just didn't come back. And so all of the families, you know, whoever invested in a trip would just lose loads of money, and whoever sort of funded that trip, their families would come hunting them. Um, oh, you, you killed my son, all, all that sort of stuff. So um, big British fat cats were like, huh, oh, there must be a way that we can sort of chin off this risk. So they created a limited company, a limited liability incorporation. That's, that's literally the invention of the limited company. So they could pass off the risk. So what they would do is they set up a limited company, they put some money into it, and that company would then go out and source a, a, you know, a ship, a crew, the supplies. And then when the ship doesn't return, they were sort of safe because they're one knuckle away from the, the, the risk, and everyone went, oh, the company. And then they can just wind down the company. So that's how limited companies came around. And so, yeah, you could invest in companies and get cash flow. Fast forward to the internet, we then had all sorts of cash flowing opportunities and capital arbitrage opportunities. Um, and then crypto. And then since crypto really came around, the amount of ROI in terms of percentage yield has just been ridiculous. So we have been ingrained into our lives that 5%, 10% per year is a good return on investment. Um, yes, in the 1950s, but these days you are losing money. You have to remember that the global hurdle for, or the cost of capital is 15%. Last year, the US expanded its currency supply by 26%. So if you were a saver in the US and made, didn't do any investing, you were 26% poorer and you don't know it. And it's insidious because your bank account still says $10,000 or $10 or whatever. So you still think you're flat, but you're not. Your purchasing power is just being like kneecapped and you don't even know it. And in the UK, we grew our um, currency supply by 15%. And every central bank across the world is expanding the currency supply by about 15% per year. So you need to, you absolutely must make more than 15% per year, otherwise you're bleeding money. And then, so with crypto, it's sort of showing the world that it doesn't need to be like that. You can beat the global hurdle. Cryptos have been an interesting thing because there's been, a, like, I've always said 99% of cryptos are pure bullshit, 1% have real utility value. And it started out like any other business. They would bootstrap it, they'd get uh, private equity or venture capitalists to come in and basically give them a bunch of seed money. They'd set up a project and, and give it a go. Then from 2017 to 2019, we had those ICOs, initial coin offerings, um, which is like the IPO, but for crypto. <clears throat> and we saw all sorts of uh, fun and games there. And then we had all sorts of platform launches. So, you know, Binance would have like a, a, a launching pad where new cryptos would basically give half their project to Binance and then Binance would shill it for them uh, and, and other such things. And then you had all sorts of, so we had ICOs and then STO, there's all sorts of I, insert any letter there, O. These days is IDOs, initial Discord offerings, which is just hilarious. Um, so what pla platforms are doing is drumming up loads of hype and interest, join our, uh, join our Discord group. They get thousands on it, and then they'd launch the whole crypto, crypto in the Discord. And we've seen some amazing launches. And now we have the high-yielding DAO launch, which is just nuts. Uh, I think that obviously, my students here knows what a DAO is, but for those who don't know, a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. Okay? So if you take a government, that is a governing organization. It's full of humans, and humans are the weak link, um, always. And what a DAO is, it's basically a robot that is programmed to do, you know, to govern stuff, and it will just do it. So no corruption, no n nothing. And w whenever there's a big thing, that it's, it's completely democratic. It will go up for a vote, and everyone that owns the token of whatever DAO it is gets, gets a say. Um, and so for the next hour, we're going to be talking about one of the game-changing DAOs out there. 
and it's called Olympus DAO. And uh, it is, it, I, I think it is an innovator of um, DeFi 2.0. So traditional finance is called CFI, centralized finance. So banks, governments, etc. DeFi is decentralized finance. And DeFi started off with, you know, cryptos like Aave, where you could do crypto loans, where you could basically borrow money in like two minutes without signing any contracts, and, and it's been great. Now, DeFi 2.0 is like the next sort of iteration of this, and Olympus is leading the way. And it's done so well that everyone is now just trying to copy them. Like, it just happens um, in any industry. Someone does really well, they just try and copy them. So, first of all, I need to understand... Um, explain what a pegged stable coin is. So for, for, the, for the newbies here, in crypto, you have these stable coins. Now, a stable coin is a crypto that is pegged to the US dollar. So if you take tether, one tether equals one US dollar, okay? Now, the dollar is obviously controlled by the Federal Reserve. And so you have all of these stable coins which are pegged to the dollar. But it's absolutely ridiculous when you look at it from a first principles point of view, because wait a minute, the dollar is deflating or is inflating away 15% per year and losing the purchasing power. So why on earth would you put money in a stable coin when you know it's just going to flitter away down the, loo, um, down the toilet like the dollar is? Um, and so you then have non-pegged stable coins. Now, I don't like the fact that Ohm is in this non-pegged stable coin because Ohm is not a stable coin. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fully backed reserve currency. It's a slight difference, okay? Now, here is the problem when you're setting up a new crypto. If I wanted to set up Siam coin, um, I'd probably promote it to everyone I know, and I would then have to go to different places to effectively rent liquidity. I'd have to go to uh, centralized exchanges or decentralized exchanges and say, hey, here's my crypto, can you put, it on, put me on your platform? And they'll all go, hmm, what's in it for me? And I'll be like, oh, I'll give you, I don't know, 25% of my tokens, or I'll give you this discount, this discount, this discount. And it's basically renting liquidity. And what you, there's a huge group of crypto participants that will basically do all, basically go from, they're like nomadic investors. So they'll go from one project, they'll, they'll pile into it, get all the, the freebies, and then they'll get out. And so if you look at the market cap, it tends to look like this. Big old pump, and then big old dump. It's a bit, bit of a rug pull there. And so renting liquidity is, is, um, is not good. So what Olympus has done is thought, hmm, this is not good. How about we own all of our own liquidity? That way, there can't be any rug pulls. There can't be any you know, groups that come in and ravage us and then leave us you know, devastated. So when you own your liquidity, your, your market cap appreciation looks like that. So what this means is that the protocol, as an Olympus DAO, owns all of the liquidity, which means that if anyone wanted to come and buy you know, huge amounts of their coin, they could. If anyone wants to sell huge amounts of their coin, they could. And, and it wouldn't crash the system. And as, as a result, Olympus DAO has just done just that, and it owns almost all of its liquidity. So you don't need to worry about, you know, oh, let's say you have the champagne problem going, oh, I've got $20 million worth of OM, I wonder if I can sell it. You can, um, which is good. Because that's one of the things, if you dick around with shit coins, sometimes you could do really well, but you can't sell. So you may think, oh, I've made £100,000 profit of this shit coin. You go to sell it, but, but there's no liquidity. You get slipped. You get negatively slipped. So you may end up only extracting 50 grand or 10 grand. Um, so you've got to be careful. And this is the market cap of Olympus. It's ridiculous. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a, in a sec. So <clears throat> let's say I want to buy $10,000 worth of Olympus. I go to um, one of the exchanges, SushiSwap, and I buy Ohm. That's what it's called, Ohm is, is, the, is the, the symbol. So that Ohm goes into the Olympus treasury, and then I get 10 Ohm. Let's just say the price is $1,000, which, I mean, it's higher than that, but let's just say it's $1,000. Easy maths. Simple enough so far, right? But the beauty of this is it's what's called a rebasing DAO. So because the currency supply of Olympus is always increasing, what it doesn't want is its shareholders or its stakers to be left out. So just like you are in the pound or, or the dollar, because the, the Fed or the Bank of England is just constantly printing, the, the value of your pounds in your pockets is getting weaker every single second. So Olympus doesn't want that. It doesn't want uh, you know, uh, deflation, so to speak, um, in terms of your purchasing power. So what it does is it does this thing called a rebase, where every eight hours, 
you will receive an, more ohm. Okay, so that way, the moment you buy Olympus, you've effectively locked in your, your little slither, slither of market cap. So no matter how much ohm is printed in the future, you still own, let's say I buy 1% of ohm, of Olymp, you know, all the ohm out there, no matter what happens, as long as I stake it, um, basically where you lock it up in, on the network, you will always have 1%, no matter what happens, whether the market cap goes like this or goes like this, you still own 1%, which is great. You don't get that with the dollar or the pound. And so every eight hours, roughly eight hours, you get more ohm, which is great. So it maintains your share of market cap. And as, as you've seen, this is what the market cap has done since its inception. It's only been around seven months. Um, <clears throat> and here's the thing, because all of this money is going into the treasury, it has something which can back up the system. So if you take Bitcoin, everyone loves Bitcoin, right? But what backs Bitcoin? Just code. There's no monetary element that backs Bitcoin. Bitcoin could go to zero in theory, highly unlikely, but it's not backed by anything. Ethereum isn't backed by anything. Most cryptos are not backed by anything. Whereas with Olympus, they're backing their whole um, currency, not by the market cap, but by their treasury. So, oh yeah, so this is the market value of treasury assets as of a couple of days ago. It is about $400 million, which is absolutely amazing. And therefore, as I did these slides, that means with all of that money, each ohm is backed, literally backed by $190. And that's rising. As, as this project grows, it's going up. So that means you know that the base floor is $190 at the moment. Uh, last time I checked, it was about $1,200. So at the moment, it's about 10% of it. But it's better than nothing. And as you can see, you'll see this chart again later. Um, because we have this treasury, it means we have a runway. Because, by the way, the yield is just ridiculous. And so people think, oh, surely this yield can't go on forever. Well, because of the treasury, it sort of can. So it's saying here, with a 500% yield, it can last, the treasury can last for 888 days. So that means if the project were to stop, and all the money was stopped pouring in, and everything just ground to a halt, there's enough money in the treasury to pay out that sort of yield for 888 days, or a 20,000% yield, it can last for 270 days, etc. So you can see uh, the runway is backing, uh, sorry, the, the treasury is backing uh, the currency. So, stakers, so by the way, for, for the newbies here, if you stake something, you're basically just locking it up on the network. So they're incentivized to stay staked with a really high yielding uh, rebase. Um, and also game three theory. So this is sort of a, a play on the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, I think you, you'll probably be, fam be familiar with it. You know, two people commit a crime, or maybe they haven't committed a crime, and, you know, the police are trying to play one off each other. And if someone gives up the other person, they get a lighter sentence, blah, blah, blah. But if they, they both stay quiet, it's win-win sometimes. So what they're saying here is, so when you, when you look at group game theory, if you and I stake we both win and the project wins. So it's in our best interest to buy and stake it. Or you can do a thing called bonding where you basically, you, you basically give a loan to the, um, to the pro protocol and then you get a discount. Um, and the worst thing you can do is unstake and then sell. So that, that is the, wor the, the worst thing. And so because of this sort of game theory, this group game theory, everyone is buying and everyone's staking. Hence, everything's going up at the moment. And as a result, over 90% of people that have Ohm are staking it, which is great. And this probably will get, it'll probably stay around 90, 95%. Now, there are three buoyancy aids to protect the price, which is why, the, by the way, the tokenomics, the sort of how, um, how it's all set up is just, is, is, I think it's game changing. And I think pretty much any crypto that's not a deploying a DAO, a rebasing DAO system is just not gonna last really. So, first of all, here is, here's a, a, a price, okay? So let's just say it's around $1,000 and there's a log chart. Um, so the first thing is that if you have a bit of a sell-off, that's because some people are unstaking and then selling. So what it does is that if, and you normally, that will probably happen when price is going down, right? People panicking, they're, they're selling. So the, the protocol is auto, automatically done. It's not a human having to press anything. The, the protocol, the code, just, just does it. So the APR that you get increases as the percentage of stakers decrease. So if this were to drop a bit, the ROI that you get, so the APR, will go up. And therefore, it incentivizes people to just stay staked, and just sit it out, um, which is good. So that's the first buoyancy aid. The second buoyancy aid 
is this one. So let so the, the hard, hard, hard base is that for every ohm there is, it's backed by one die. A die is a, is a, a pegged stable coin. Um, so basically one dollar. So that is the hard, hard floor, even though it is backed with, with the treasury assets to about $190. But what it means is that if the price were to ever plummet, the, the moment it hits one dollar, before it gets near there actually, the, the Dow, because it sat on a huge treasury, will actually burn ohm and buy ohm to ensure it remains above one dollar. So the code will automatically deploy its vast treasury to protect the price. So yeah, obviously you can't, you know, um, stop it. I mean, in theory, if we had a massive sell-off, yeah, it could spike below a, a dollar, but it won't stay below one because it will just deploy its treasury just to burn ohm to help push price up and also buy it, which will push price up. And that's why the stock market is all-time highs at the moment because companies are just buying their own stock. That's the only reason the stock market is soaring, corporate buybacks. Companies are borrowing money, unlimited amounts of money from the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve at like half a percent or 0.25 percent APR. And then they're just going onto the market and just buying back their own stock. whoop de doo price goes up. So it's sort of the same thing. And the third one is the bonding mechanism. So you can buy ohm on the market and just stake it. That's the easy way. Or you can do a bond. Now, every time you hear the word bond for the rest of your life, just replace it with three letters, I-O-U. So all it's doing is, if I were to go, go ignore this one, this is a bit of spirit, spirit is sold out, obviously. But let's t take this one here. So what this means is, if I had a whole bunch of die, I could basically give that die to the protocol and, uh, as, as a loan. They take that, and they'll give you a coupon, uh, which is like a, an ROI. So you, the, it's, a, it's basically a five-day loan. So you give them a five-day loan, and at the end of five days, they'll give you some ohm, but at a 4.79% discount. So what you'll see at the moment, because price is going up, the bond is, is not much point, because at the moment you're making something like 6% over five days just by staking. So there's no point trying to do the bond thing. But as price is going down, what you'll find is that th these bond prices will be going up. So, then, so it then incentivizes people to go, oh, sweet, I can, you know, give them some of my ether and get like, I know, 10% ROI over a five day period and I, and I get, you know, like a, a really cheap ohm. <clears throat> so the lucky bastards who got in on this <laughs> bond, they were able to um, do a liquidity pool um, uh, token and get a 117.8% discount on their ohm. Lucky gets. Um, <laughs> so yeah, obviously that's sold out really quickly. So there's three buoyancy aids. Again, if this doesn't make sense, don't worry. Now, obviously, if you give, if you're offering, you know, thousands of percent APY, um, <clears throat> that can't last forever, okay? And and it won't. It, it mathematically can't. I mean, unless you're a Ponzi scheme. And so here, there's this is the emission um, cycle. So this is where we are right now. So the APY, I'll talk about APY and APR in a minute. The APY is between a thousand percent and ten thousand percent. So as I checked last night, it was like eight thousand something percent. But as the circulating supply increases, the yield drops. So we're about 3 million uh, circulating coins. When it gets to 10 million coins, we're then going to drop into, uh, into this tier. So the, the yield will drop to about 500 to 1,000%, something, something like that. And as it goes on, obviously, and then eventually, if, if we get over here, this means this is like, a, this is like as big as Bitcoin um, in, terms of, in terms of market cap. And therefore, the yield will be pretty pants. Now, <clears throat> how long will it take there? So we're, we're due to hit this level here uh, in January, which is over here. So we've got a few months of sort of left of 8,000 odd percent. And then in January, it's going to drop down to about one to, yeah, about 1,000%. Um, yeah, or 1,000% max. Um, yeah, so make hay now.